the model was originally developed back in the mid 1990s uh, by a meteorologist with the Forest Service, uh, Lee Lavdis, who was at the Macon uh, Fire Lab at the time. Uh, so this was, you know, uh, really one of the early attempts at getting us a uh, tool for helping predict smoke impacts downwind from fires. Now for the uh, more technical answer to uh, what V-smoke is, uh, it's what's referred to as a Gaussian plume model. Uh, I just threw this equation in because now I can say I'm giving a technical talk because I used an equation. Uh, we're not going to deal with this anymore. But the real key here is this idea of this Gaussian plume model. And what that really is, is a collection of bell curves. Everybody's heard of grading on the curve. Well, this is basically smoke on the curve. What this model assumes is that as the smoke moves away from the source, it is going to spread out uh, and obey this kind of Gaussian curve where along the plume, waiting for my pointer to show up on here, Okay, this looks like the pointer is being finicky now. All right, well, in this graph on the lower right where we have the three different colored lines. Scott, I could see uh, the, the pointer. What you can see if it is, shows up on your screen, yes, just uh, drag it the, the with pointer. your cursor. If it shows up on your screen, just drag it. Uh, it's cursor. not showing up on my screen. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, there it is. Now we got it. Although I don't know what that. Okay, there's our pointer. So what the Gaussian plume model does is along the center line of the plume is where the highest concentration is going to always be and then the concentration is going to decay off to the sides of the plume. Now what happens is a plume moves downwind you'll start with a high concentration near the source that hasn't spread out much but as it moves further downwind it's going to begin to spread out and further downwind spread out even more and I don't know if it's perfect on this graph but generally the area under each of these curves is exactly the same so there's the same amount of smoke it's just spread, being spread out through a larger area which helps reduce the concentration so uh, Lee Lavdis didn't invent the Gaussian plume model. It's been in widespread use for a long time, particularly for industrial source emissions, uh, smokestacks primarily. So here you get kind of an idea of what a Gaussian plume looks like. It looks kind of like a, uh, it's basically a cone that's been squished. You can kind of see here that, it, you know, they're showing the concentration here on the side is spreading out according to one of these Gaussian curves and it's doing the same thing in the vertical but you can see that it's spreading much more horizontally than vertically and that depends on the meteorology that's going on uh, how that partitioning of spread between vertical and horizontal is going to happen and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we get further into this but kind of the idea between these things with these Gaussian plume models is this plume represents kind of the time average of where the plume is going to be. You can see in this side view that the plume is actually probably going to be looping up and down as it moves downwind. But with time its average is going to be somewhere between this upper boundary and a lower boundary with the peak average concentration being along this plume center line which then gives us our bell curve along the edge here. Now 
Now, one of the things that Lavdis had to deal with was making a smokestack more like a fire. And the big part in doing that is we have to bring that source to the ground. So now we've got our smoke leaving with a little bit of buoyancy and moving downwind and then impacting the ground here further downwind. Now one thing that happens in these Gaussian plume models when the pollutant intersects the ground it gets reflected. So this concentration that we're showing below ground here actually gets added back in here and pushes this curve out a little bit more to give you a higher concentration at the ground. And how much impact you have near the source is kind of determined by how much heat you're releasing in your fire, how much buoyancy there is. And again, we'll see this a little bit more in more detail uh, as we get into the case study. Now to some of the assumptions and limitations in the model, uh, one big one is that a Gaussian plume model such as V-smoke assumes that weather is constant. It's not changing. You're giving it some fixed parameters and they're uniform in space and constant. Uh, depending on how long your burn is going to last will partly determine how good of an assumption this ability to have constant conditions is. And also your location. Uh, if you're down on the coast in a sea breeze area, your ability to have constant weather is going to be greatly reduced. Uh, another thing that V-smoke assumes is that the terrain is relatively flat. Uh, as you can see here in this graph again with our smokestack, you know, you can actually impact this topographic feature earlier than other areas or earlier than you would if the ground was flat. But this picture looks a little bit different when we do the ground release. When we move the ground so that you know, we have our fire over here on the flat terrain. The maximum concentration is along this plume center line, and it's going straight into our terrain feature. So when you're in complex terrain, you're going to have some problems with the model. Doesn't mean it can't be useful. Just means you have to interpret what's going on a little bit more, understand where a terrain feature may be tall enough to move into an area of higher concentration. Because basically, any, as you move up in elevation, you're going to move towards that center of the plume where the highest concentrations are. Now, the other problem in complex terrain is that, as seen in this side view, this plume is going up and over this feature. Well, that's just because we don't have the full 3D view the terrain can actually steer how this plume is going to move through the terrain. And that is not accounted for in V-smoke, uh, as we'll see when we do the case study. So these two big limitations of having to have constant weather and terrain being really flat uh, may at first look like they really limit what you can do with the model. But as we'll show with the case study, you can actually make some use of this tool in situations where you're going to be breaking these assumptions. But you have to be aware that, you're, that these problems could occur. All right, vSmoke Web. Uh, vSmoke is a tool that's hosted by uh, the Southern High Resolution Modeling Consortium. Uh, it's a partnership between the University of Georgia and the Southern Research Station of the U.S. Forest Service, uh, where we host a number of different smoke products, uh, one of them being this web-enabled version of V-Smoke. Uh, 
Uh, so basically we have a list of tools here along the right hand side. Uh, vSmoke I think is the third one down and then just a description of each tool uh, to give you a general idea of what's available. So here's the general interface for vSmoke Web. Uh, we use Google Maps uh, as our visualization tool uh, that gives you the ability to see anything you'd see in Google Maps. You can turn on the satellite view and actually see the aerial photography that they have. You can see all the streets and information that uh, Google Maps supplies. And vSmoke Web is designed to be very user-friendly and simple to use. Uh, much, much simpler than using the standalone version of vSmoke or the version of vSmoke that's attached to ArcGIS, referred to as vSmoke GIS. Uh, we've really tried to uh, pare down what the user has to supply and allow a lot of flexibility at the same time. And basically the user will work through a number of input fields over here on the right hand side to get an idea of what's going on. And kind of zooming in a little bit uh, closer to that. Oops, went one too far. You can kind of see that the, the inputs are kind of generally grouped into setting a location with a providing a latitude longitude supplying some fire information such as the size of the fire and the duration of how long you think this is going to go on for and these these are ballpark numbers they don't have to be absolute uh, the planned ignition method uh, right now there's really only two that are in here and we'll talk a little bit more about these but it's basically going to be either a backing or a spot type ignition or a uh, heading fire or aerial ignition. Uh, we have some general information about fuels to be input. Uh, fuels are you know, not given in standard fuel models. Uh, the fuels here are just designed to get you in a neighborhood. Uh, you know, we have a number of different grass shrub, litter models, and as you select one, it's just going to change this uh, fuel load number of how many tons available for fuel. And if you don't like any of the values that come out, you can just edit the number that's in here and not even worry about the drop down. You can just directly edit here, and if you know how many tons per acre there are supposed to be, just put the number in. And that's kind of the way this works all along. This interface is designed to help the user but not constrain them to have to take our answer. Uh, the same thing, kind of thing happens here with our fuel moisture. Uh, we're just looking for a rough scenario of fuel moisture. Do you consider the fuels dry, very dry, uh, moist, damp? Uh, so just some general adjectives that are then going to give you an idea of percent consumed. And If you have an idea of what that number should be, you can just uh, directly change it in the box. Uh, the results of all those inputs up there is normally to tell you what your particle emission rate and heat release rate are going to be. And again, these are just guidelines. There are other tools such as the fire emissions uh, prediction system or production system, I forget which, uh, FEPS which is designed to output these two variables and if you use that tool uh, you can take your numbers and just directly enter them here and move on. We have the general weather inputs that are used here, uh, mixing height and transport winds and wind direction from your uh, weather forecast and probably one of the trickier ones is this idea of what the stability class is. Uh, this is a measure of the atmosphere's resistance to vertical motion. The more unstable the atmosphere, the stronger the vertical mixing 
the more your plume is going to mix vertically both up and back down. Uh, so this can be a, a major parameter and its set is just a selection of a couple of different categories. Uh, one important note, if, you, if we clicked on this and expanded it, is there are none of the very stable classes that normally reflect nighttime conditions. Uh, v smoke is not recommended for trying to predict what smoke is going to do at night. Uh, so we don't even allow you to put in the very stable conditions that would reflect nighttime conditions. Uh, it's not going to do what you want at night. And then the last thing the user has to do is run the model. Uh, just by clicking on the button. There's a couple of optional fields down here, uh, such as what the background concentration of PM 2.5 would be. Uh, we specify 5 as an initial guess. If you know something different, you're free to, to enter that value. Uh, for those using uh, more advanced dispersion models, such as high split, uh, we actually will output here uh, information as far as how many uh, total emissions of PM 2.5 there are at, as in when you run the model as a input for people who want high split. This was a user requested feature. They wanted to be able to see the difference between a V smoke run and a high split run so we gave them a comparable number for direct input into high split. Now what V smoke web is going to produce as output will be contours on that map up above. And the contours will be colored according to the air quality index, where uh, green won't show up because we're not going to show you where it's good, because obviously with the smoke plume, we're not producing good air quality. But we'll show you contours of the moderate level. Unhealthy for sensitive groups will be in orange, unhealthy in red, and then very unhealthy in purple. This input here of plume rise fraction, uh, this is really what's set when you, on the uh, screen above where we had the firing type, where you could choose, choose between a backing fire or an aerial ignition, that is how this uh, value gets set. And this kind of goes to what Lavdis had to struggle with to make a tool designed for representing a smokestack more like a fire. So what this plume rise fraction controls is how much of the smoke released is going to go up in the convective column. So if the value is set to 1, all the smoke goes up in the convective column, and when it reaches its uh, the plume rise height or how where it becomes neutri neutrally buoyant, this is the point where this Gaussian dispersion thing will begin, and it'll start to produce its cone. Now, most fires don't get all the smoke in the convective column. There's normally kind of that curtain of smoke that's hanging down below the main convective column. And if the plume rise fraction is set somewhere between 0 and 1, that controls how much of that goes up in the column and how much of it is this smoke that's going to be released from the ground, neutrally buoyant already, and it will drift along the ground and begin to spread according to that Gaussian cone. Uh, I think we set it to a value of 0 0.75 for an aerial ignition, so we get a lot of the smoke, 75% going up in the column, and about 25% uh, coming out is the drift smoke. Uh, that is an estimate and a guess. It's a parameter to be played with and further investigated. Uh, for values of that plume, plume rise fraction below zero, between minus one and zero, we're actually doing a combination of 
releasing as almost a uniform wall of smoke between the ground and the mixed layer and this surface uh, free drift smoke. Uh, this is the one that Lavdis found to be uh, best representative of most uh, hand ignition prescribed fires and we use a value of about I think minus 0 0.5 uh, so that we kind of get a balance between the smoke that's uh, up in the column and what's drifting along the ground. Uh, but these values are guesses from observations. Uh, there hasn't been a definitive scientific study on this, uh, largely because it's fairly hard to do. I think we've got some recent data that might help with it, but as of right now it's part of the art of modeling smoke. So art equals guessing. All right, so that's kind of just an overview of what all goes into it, but now we're going to actually walk through and do a case study. And we'll show V-Smoke output and how it can be used. For our case study, we're actually going to go into an area of complex terrain. Uh, we're going to look at uh, the Brush Creek burn uh, from the Cherokee National Forest back in March of 2006. Uh, this was a case where they had a burn of about 1,800 acres. Uh, the area had not been burned in recent memory by wildfire, and there had been no attempt at prescribed burning uh, previously in this area. Uh, the fuel consumption estimate by the uh, people planning the burn was about 12 tons per acre. Uh, definitely for that system showing that it hadn't been burned in a while. So here's kind of a, of a view of where our, from the satellite, of where the burn was and how the smoke plume uh, moved through the mountains. You can actually see that thinking about our Gaussian cone, it initially doesn't look too bad, but as we interact with more and more mountains, and interact with you know winds on this flatter terrain you can see it kind of spreading along some ridges and valleys a little bit differently uh, it's not a great representation of our of our cone but all in all for a burn of 1800 acres I'd say it's actually not going to be that bad but the real question is could V smoke have been useful in their planning process and how they looked at the potential smoke impacts for this burn. And one of the reasons we studied this as a case study was because they did have an air quality impact on Asheville, North Carolina. You can see that the PM 2.5 concentration for previous days is moving along nicely in the good area. And then late on the afternoon of the burn we get a strong peak up into the area that's in the unhealthy for sensitive groups. Uh, this was not very well received by the public in Asheville, as you can imagine. Numerous smoke complaints were, file, were filed. Uh, many uh, local fire departments were being called for fires that weren't there just because of the smoke in the urban area. People weren't sure where the fire was. Uh, many, many headaches for the people that did that burn. All right, so how would we have used vSmoke web for this? Well, we would have first had to select our location, which in this case, uh, we just zoomed into the area. And this is roughly, I don't have the exact latitude and longitude. And all that was done was clicking on the map. And when you click on the map, it'll uh, put the marker here and enter your latitude and longitude in decimal degrees. If you know your latitude and longitude, you can just enter them and when you run the model it will zoom to your location. Uh, the fire size from their report was about 1,840 acres. Uh, the duration, I'm guessing, they were planning on a ignition at about noon. 
uh, we'll just take it from noon till about 8 o'clock. Figuring 8 hours would give us time to get most of the smoke uh, taken care of. And I think actually this is, uh, I think actually the plan was for 6 hours, to have most of it done by 6. Uh, this is actually from a, a different run. So that number should be about 6. The ignition method was going to be an aerial ignition. So we'll just select that as an option. Uh, my initial uh, click on entering the fuel type was I picked, uh, assume this would be a litter model from what I considered heavy litter or the system considered heavy litter and it said six tons per acre. Uh, that was a little bit low. So just went in and since they estimated about 12 tons per acre consumed, I just went ahead and entered 12 tons per acre directly and instead of using a fuel moisture scenario I just set the percent consumed to 100 percent so that it would match what they were thinking was going to happen on their burn. Uh, the next real part to input uh, would be the weather. You can see for the emissions it's already calculated your emission rate your heat release rate. It's calculated the total emissions for use in high split. So all that's left is entering the weather, which for their uh, spot weather forecast was a mixing height of about 4,100 feet. Transport winds from the northwest at uh, 15 miles an hour. And the estimated stability class was rated as moderately unstable. Uh, Stability class is normally estimated based on your surface air temperature, your wind speed, and the uh, cloud cover. So with that information from a spot weather forecast, there's actually a little uh, decision tree that will guide you through to determining a stability class. And we hope to implement that uh, decision tree here to help with this choice instead of forcing the user to choose it. It's probably the one area that's least user friendly right now is having to know that bit of information since it is not normally in your spot weather forecast. Although you can ask for it in a spot weather forecast and the meteorologist uh, should be able to provide it. Uh, once all the information is entered you click the run button and within a few seconds probably up to about 30 seconds it'll take you'll get back uh, your your V smoke output your your plume here and based on the information that we had about that burn we can see that we're getting the definite unhealthy for sensitive individuals impacting a large area of Asheville with even an area of unhealthy concentrations reaching the Asheville area uh, looking at this information it would have been uh, questionable to go ahead with the burn on that day. One of the other things you get when you run this is the system is going to produce what's called a KML file for you which if you want to you can uh, right click on this and choose the option to save as and save it to your computer and you can later open up your vSmoke run and view it in Google Earth, uh, which is useful for saving a copy for yourself. Uh, a lot of people have found that to be very informative since in Google Earth you can actually get locations of schools and hospitals and add to your smoke screening process. So V-Smoke suggests that there would be a smoke impact in doing this burn as, as planned. One of the things we can do with V-Smoke is it's a really good tool for game playing and understanding how to possibly mitigate these problems. So some por uh, possible tactics for reducing the smoke impact would be burn over a longer period to reduce the peak hourly emissions. If we take a little bit longer and spread the emissions out so we're not putting as much in the atmosphere at any one time, what does that do to our smoke impacts.
Well, if we extend the burn period, as I said, to eight hours instead of the six that it should have been when I first showed that graph, you can see that we've pulled back the area of unhealthy air quality, but we're still impacting Asheville with a pretty significant sized area of unhealthy for sensitive individuals. Uh, so doing that one measure of spreading the, the ignition out over a longer period of time helped somewhat, but we probably still could possibly do a little bit more. Uh, we could look at uh, consuming less fuel by burning at a higher fuel moisture level. Uh, try to burn under conditions that reduce our consumption. For an area that hasn't had prescribed fire in it, that actually might be a fairly well-recommended thing to do to avoid mortality as in some of this litter and upper layers of soil, you might have some issues with feeder roots that might be really sensitive to that fire if you consumed all of that available fuel. So if we then uh, choose a moisture scenario that gives us about 70% of that 12 tons consumed, you can see that now we've pulled back the uh, area of unhealthy for sensitive individual impact and gotten it out of Asheville. We're still impacting a town in the area, but we're making some progress to having fairly minimal, to lowering our air quality impacts. Another uh, possible mitigation thing would be to break the unit in half and try to burn it on two separate occasions. What would our smoke impacts look like if that was done? Well now you can see that we've almost completely contained the poor air quality impacts to the area of the forest. We do still put smoke into Asheville but this would be considered more at the nuisance level of smoke and would get you get complaints but with proper uh, public relations you might be able to even mitigate the number of complaints you had from that kind of issue. So that's kind of how you can use V-Smoke to work through some possible scenarios for mitigating any smoke uh, problems. Now another uh, mitigation technique that could have been used would be, well, you know, does changing that burn technique make a difference? You know, I've made the unit smaller. Could I burn it differently than doing an aerial ignition and, and see if that changes my smoke impacts? And initially it may look like we didn't make a big difference. Uh, the area for unhealthy for sensitive individuals is about in the same location. Where we did make an impact was back here closer to the source, where we now have a larger area of unhealthy air uh, just downwind of the source because we played with that balance between how much smoke is subject to plume rise and how much of it is released more as a wall. We've kind of moved from a situation like this where part of the smoke is lofting well up and then eventually mixing back down, giving us that near source reduction in emissions versus one that's increasing it uh, in the area of the source. So we didn't, uh, playing with this plume rise fraction may not have a big impact on the long range transport. It's more going to impact your close to the source conditions. So, yes, V smoke assumes constant weather and flat terrain, but we can still use it as an instructive tool for looking at possible mitigation strategies. With the help of a tool like uh, Google Earth, loading that uh, those plumes into Google Earth and overlaying them on the three-dimensional topography would give you an idea of where you're going to see uh, areas of elevated terrain that are going to poke up further into that uh, 
cone of smoke and get those higher doses. So you can kind of see that and get a feel for what's going to happen with that. Uh, you know, again, you know, we don't get the channeling of smoke that's going to happen in complex terrain. But we, we can make some ideas of what's going to happen as far as concentrations downwind, how far those concentrations may travel. But I think some of the real value in using uh, V-Smoke for doing some smoke management is that you can play games and look at mitigation strategies and understand what some of these different values uh, that get input to the model mean. Uh, if you have an issue with your forecasts of mixing height in an area, you could look at the impact of changing mixing height by just running a couple of cases with the model. Again, it only takes seconds to do and see how variations in that mixing height are going to, you know, affect those smoke impacts and may impact your decision making. Now, what are we doing as far as the future of vSmoke Web? Well, there's always bug fixes. Uh, we've had a problem with the system recently because Google updated how you interface with their Google Maps system. And that broke our, our system. We're still in the process of recovering from that. It works most of the time. The one bug we haven't solved yet is occasionally you'll run the model and you won't see anything show up on the map, but it'll tell you there's a KML file for you to download. And if you download the KML file, sure enough, it shows up in Google Earth just fine, but for some reason the, the web isn't displaying it properly. Uh, we haven't been able to nail that one down yet. We hope to have that in the next week or so. Uh, one of the outputs that the older vSmoke GIS produces is a text report that's actually very nice for attaching to your burn prescription. It outlines a lot of what you did as far as modeling in a nice printable manner. And we hope to have that feature implemented here so that along with downloading a KML file, there will be a link for you to download a printable PDF file of what you did as far as smoke modeling. Uh, we've had requests to incorporate the ability to include multiple wind directions when you run the model. Uh, we're trying to figure out how best to implement that from a user interface and interpreting output perspective, but we're going to uh, see what we can do. Some of these other future things are a much more extensive overhaul of the core of what vSmoke does. Uh, we're looking at trying to be able to incorporate changes in the weather. If you're going to get a wind shift, how do we handle that? There are Gaussian plume models that do handle that and account for that. Can we adapt that methodology into vSmoke to make something that would be useful in coastal areas with the influence of a sea breeze? Can we do stuff to more explicitly include complex terrain in what vSmoke does? There are cases where this has been done. Uh, we're exploring what we can do to incorporate that into vSmoke. Uh, a lot of uh, burns in the mountains uh, could really make a lot of use if we could uh, do a better job of incorporating this idea of what's going to happen when the smoke plume encounters changes in topography. Uh, this idea of ensemble runs, this is kind of the game playing idea where you would input your parameters and the computer system would run not just your parameters but slight changes in those and show you what those changes would mean to your smoke concentrations to kind of give you an idea of how much confidence you can have in what the model is producing. If it's producing very consistent results with large changes in your input parameters, you can be fairly confident that it's going to be pretty stable in what it does. 
And of course, like I said before, this plume rise fraction is really now the art of the modeling side. You have to kind of get a feel for what it should look like. Uh, we've got some data from some recent studies on plume rise uh, that will hopefully inform this choice and we can do more to automate it and make it more science and less art. Uh, but that's kind of the the state of vSmoke web. And at this point, if we have questions, I'd love to entertain some questions. And if, if you have things you'd like to see this tool be able to do, I'd love to hear about those as well. Well, thanks, Scott. That was outstanding. Uh, uh, thanks, Scott. Scott. That was if you all just joined us during the presentation, my name is David you Godwin. Joined us I'm the outreach the coordinator for the Southern Empire Godwin. Exchange. We just had a great presentation by Dr. Scott Goodrick, the research we meteorologist at the U.S. Forest Service Southern Research Station. So we have some questions that have come in already. Switch so over here. We have here. some questions that have come in already. Switch over. show these to everyone and uh, we'll try and work through those and if, if you guys have other yeah, questions we'll you can enter those, those either in the, in the guys have other questions, chat box at the bottom or the question window chat box at the bottom or the question window as well so it's so one of the questions we had come in first uh, was from Laura, and she asked, "Is there one a, of the questions we had an advantage to using in. vSmoke first um, on the web versus the ArcGIS environment?" Smoke on the web versus environment. Okay, the advantage to using vSmoke web over the uh, vSmoke GIS. Uh, one, you don't have to have ArcGIS. Uh, the user interface is a little bit easier. Uh, you don't have to deal with using the uh, fire emissions production tool, uh, FEPS. Uh, so we've kind of integrated that into vSmoke web to get you further along the process just in you know kind of a one-stop shop uh, kind of situation. Uh, I would say that vSmoke web is a little bit more limited than vSmoke GIS. If you really want to get into the modeling you can play with more of the parameters uh, that we don't uh, really exposed to the user. We kind of just went and uh, decided based on expert opinion what those numbers should be and fixed them. Uh, but that's, you know, personal choice. You know, if you want more ability to get under the hood, yeah, vSmoke GIS is probably the tool. All right, Scott. It sounds like everybody else can hear the, um, right, the feedback. It sounds like so everybody I'm else can mute you while I read the questions, and I'll unmute you to answer. Mute you while I read the questions, and I'll unmute you to answer. Okay. There. Let's see if that works. Okay. So the next question we had uh, came from Trent, and he said, "Is the duration uh, of lighting time or overall time mm, not really following you there, Trent? It looks like is." Asking a little bit more of a clarification on the um, the ignition period, how how long you're doing ignitions during the burn. Let's see, can you hear Scott, or can you talk now? is the time of active burning. Not just when ignition is happening, but as long as it's actively flaming combustion. Uh, again, it's, it's a guess. It's not a precise thing. We're just trying to get an estimate of what the peak hourly emissions should be. And again, we're just trying to get in a ballpark because of 
the high level of uncertainty that feeds through the system as far as uncertainty in fuel loads, uncertainty in fuel moisture. You know, there, there's a lot of uncertainty that goes into estimating emissions. So it's, it's a guess. Uh, for most burns, you know, here, since they were planning on igniting at uh, around noon and planned on having most of their aerial ignition done by about four o'clock and a lot of the fire should have you know they were guessing was about six o'clock we went with six hours for the case where we said well what if we started earlier we extended to starting ignition at 10 and proceeding more slowly so that we dragged it out to eight hours uh, for the active flaming phase uh, but no, it's not an exact, you know, we started lighting at this time and we were done lighting here, you know, how long was that? It, that's not what it is. It's just an idea of how long you think the active burn phase is going to be. Another question we had, Another Scott, question came we from had. Mark Melvin. Mark here in the feedback again, and he was asking about uh, and was fuels, asking about and he was asking what tie black fuels should be uh, considered in fuel consumption. And I had another question to tag on, tack on to that. Uh, and it looks like fuel loads an important aspect, uh, an input for the model. Could you provide some recommendations or guidance on um, tools or or methods for estimating fuel loads to to go into the model runs? Okay, uh, as far as what time lag fuels, it's going to depend on what you think is going to get consumed on your burn. Uh, you know, we're making estimates for, you know, this is largely for prescribed fires, is what the tool is designed for. And so we are looking more at, you know, ones and 10 hour fuels uh, totals. As far as for uh, tools for estimating uh, fuel loads. Uh, there's a uh, photo series tool that in many areas can be quite useful where you can go out and look at the photo series and compare it to your stand. Um, it's a product from the Pacific Northwest uh, Research Station. They have photo series for all across the country. I know they have ones for the coastal plain. Uh, across the southeast, uh, not as much as you get up into the Piedmont in Appalachians. Uh, but generally I like the the photo series tools because you can, you know, you're out walking around a unit anyways while you're planning a burn to get an idea of what's out there. Uh, just grabbing a photo series and bringing it along and comparing the pictures. Uh, we've used it in a number of research uh, conditions and gotten fairly good results uh, when compared against destructive sampling. So, you know, just kind of walking around and taking a look with one of these uh, photo series tools, you can get pretty close. Uh, there's also GIS type products from Landfire and other uh, databases where you can get an idea of fuel loading. You can get fuel loading from the fuel models from the uh, Southern Risk Assessment data set. They have a fuels map that will which will allow you to get an idea of fuel loads. All right, well, well that's, all, that's definitely helpful. Uh, another question that came in that I think was definitely helpful. Uh, another question uh, that came target in here was from Paul. Uh, target here was from and Paul. And he has a question about scale for the tool. He has a question and about scale the for the tool. model we used to assess 100 acre burns at, at a one mile scale. At, at a one could mile you just talk about scale? Uh, at what scale about? was the model really designed to work? At what scale was the model really designed to work? Well, I would say yes, you can use it for that. Um, you're, when you get to that close, that smaller scale, and 
looking at impacts closer to the source, the importance of that plume rise fraction is going to be, you know, kind of a controlling thing in how good the results are. And so I'd say there'd be a fair bit of uncertainty in doing that. Uh, you could definitely do some stuff for kind of worst case impacts by uh, putting that uh, plume rise fraction uh, maybe a little bit higher, or I'm sorry, a little bit lower than that minus 0 0.5. Um, or actually, you put it, if we set it at zero, that means that all the smoke is going to be surface released and have no buoyancy. So that should give you absolute worst case for your uh, short range smoke impacts. Because none, at, at a value of zero, none of your smoke is assumed to be getting loft into a convective column. So I would be cautious using it, but yes, you can use it to get some ideas. Here's a, another question we had and came from Trent. Here's a, another question. And he we was had looking for some Trent. Ideas on expanding that stability Ideas on uh, input for, that it looks like the next generation of the model. This is when you provide stability guidance, could you also provide a method so for using temperature profiles weather balloon soundings to determine the stability class? Weather balloon soundings to determine the stability class. Yeah, that would be kind of that next generation kind of thing, because we would also like to hook it into weather prediction models so that we can... Uh, you know, I kind of view the balloons as a little bit less useful since, you know, the nearest balloon to this uh, Brush Creek was nowhere nowhere close. I mean, I, I think uh, Greenville, uh, you know, so nowhere near the site of the burn. But if we were using stuff from a numerical weather prediction model, we could get a, an approximate sounding right there at that location and at that time which you know the weather balloons are limited to twice a day basically one in the morning and one in the evening but yes we are looking at trying to get that uh, I would like to see the whole idea of stability class disappear from the modeling system so that users don't have to deal with that at all We had another question from Jen Evans, and she's asking a question from Jen about Evans. Uh, she's smoke asking sensitive areas. About, and uh, smoke sensitive when areas. you're looking at an output and of moderate air quality, output, uh, could you moderate air quality. talk about what smoke sensitive areas might not be a concern at air quality level? That air quality level. Well, I, personally, I view. Even in the moderate, you have a concern for any smoke-sensitive features. Uh, if, from the least of it, from a public relations uh, uh, point of view, you know, I would not, you know, when I think of smoke-sensitive features at the moderate, you know, let's you know we could kind of triage them into you know you got the roads and highways well the moderate level of concentration isn't going to be enough to produce a visibility reduction that would be a hazard so for those features you would be you know not having to worry too much but the schools and hospitals where you have the sensitive individuals you know just because we say you're in that yellow area that moderate area you could be close to that uh, value that would put, you know, this idea of what's sensitive for an individual, the nature of an individual means somebody could be sensitive at a lower level. So those ones, you know, particularly schools, nursing homes, hospitals, uh, any place where you think there might be uh, the sensitive individuals, I would say those are ones that cannot be ignored even in a moderate case. Gotcha. Looks like we have uh, one more question. Time for one more question here. We have a few other questions in as well. Maybe they can contact you uh, at yeah. your email. 
address there on the screen. The one more question came from Jennifer Miller. She's asking if Vsmoke automatically populates uh, other She's meteorological conditions and as part of the model. Uh, other meteorological and conditions and as part of the model. Is the data that's coming in are, are those NOAA uh, National Weather is Service data? data that's coming in are, are those NOAA uh, National Weather Service data? Uh, no, the only weather information that VSmoke uses is what you enter on that form. So it basically just uses mixing height, transport wind speed and direction, and stability class. Uh, you can get that information from NOAA, but you would have to enter it. At this point, there is no connection to any forecast or historical weather database that can be used with that. Uh, it's purely user-driven. Now, connecting to actual forecast data is something that we do have planned. But as of right now, it's not part of the system. All right. Well, thank you for that clarification. Right. Thanks for all the well, questions you that you've answered here at the end, Scott. Thanks for all the questions that you've answered here at the end, Scott. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined us today. Uh, like we said at the beginning, this uh, webinar was recorded today. and we'll have the uh, archive like said the beginning, on our YouTube page recorded, uh, in about a week or so. So thanks everyone for joining us and thanks again, Scott, for the fantastic presentation. Thanks everyone for joining us and thanks again, Scott, for the fantastic presentation. <laughs>